It's time to begin, and I'm glad you guys are here. Hope that everything is going well for you. We have just a couple of announcements tonight. I want you all to remember the family and the death of Bruce Howell. That funeral was this afternoon here today. Uh, and I, I thank you for all the ones who were able to come. It made a difference to them. The family really appreciated that. Steve Tant has been moved to Stallworth Rehab at Vanderbilt. He's in room 2020B and uh, still recovering from a, it's a long and difficult process. He had damage that was done because of COVID-19 and it's going to be a while before he recovers. Uh, Zane Burns is here. He's going to lead us in prayer right now. Bow, please. Dear Lord in heaven, we come before your throne. Uh, we are thankful for your son Jesus who died on the cross to save us from our sins. We are thankful for his church. We are thankful for this church. Uh, we are thankful that we can meet this evening free in this great nation. We are thankful for Bill as he's going to open up your word that we can learn more about you. We are saddened in the loss of our brother Bruce Howe. We ask that you be with his kids. They have been long time members here at this church and we want to pray for our brother Steve Tant. Uh, we are thankful that he's making some improvement. We know he has a long road. He is a uh, lots of service to this church. He has served our country and, and we want him and his family to know that we pray for, pray for him daily and we're very thankful for him and his family. We ask at this time that you be with our country. Uh, we have many problems in this country, and most are due to the lack of Jesus being put in each one of our lives. We ask that uh, we know that the ground is fertile in this country, and uh, please help us not to be afraid to bring up Jesus as uh, we need it in the worst way at this time. And everything is in his name we pray. Amen. Appreciate that. All right. Well, turn over to Ezra chapter 5. That's where we're going to be tonight, and I hope that uh, this will be helpful. Let me see. Is, the, is it coming up? Is our PowerPoint coming up? It isn't so far. Um, do we need to do something about that? Okay, well, I, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, since I'm, well, it may take a minute or two to get the PowerPoint up. Let me just take you back and give you a little bit of background. I was going to do this anyway. Go back to Ezra chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 for a moment to get the background. Because in Ezra chapter 5, the opposition continues. In Ezra 4, you remember the opposition began and you saw it. And then uh, we're going to go back and look at how that happened and then, and then look at how, it's, how we... Uh, progresses as you get into chapter 5. Here we go. Uh, the opposition continues. So here we are, Ezra chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Then Jeshua, and you also know that his name is Joshua, then Jeshua, the son of Josedach, and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, arose and built the altar of the God of Israel to bur offer burnt offerings on it, as is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its bases and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both morning and evening offer, burnt offerings. And this happened not long after they, re, after they arrived back into the land from uh, their captivity. But notice that they were afraid even then. But even though they were afraid, they put up the altar and began to offer up on the altar the things that were there. That's Ezra chapter 3. When you get into Ezra chapter 4, listen to verse 24. Thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So the work stopped. Now the reason the work stopped is because of the protests and the threats that were coming from the people who opposed what they were doing, the people who were enemies of the Jews, and particularly from those who had said, we want to help you build, and yet they didn't really believe just in the God of heaven, believed in a lot of other gods. They were not allowed to do it, and as a result of that, uh, they decided to stop it. I think their plan from the beginning was to stop it from the inside, and if they couldn't do that, they would try to stop it from the outside. Now, we'll get into chapter 5, and I want you to notice verse 1. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Idu, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. 
Now, they began to prophesy to get them to continue to build this that they had stopped building. If you want to know the kind of a rough timeline, here it is. From 536 to 530 B.C., the work progressed for about six years. They, remember, it's in the second year that they're there that they begin, and they've been working on this temple. But then in 530 B.C., the work stopped. It stopped because they were threatened on the one hand, and then the king said that they had to stop. They, they wrote to the king of Persia, and he writes back and says they have to stop. Now, from 530 to 520, for a 10-year period, nothing's being done on the temple. The people are taking care of their cities and houses, but there's absolutely nothing that's being done on the temple because the people are afraid. And if you read Haggai, the first 11 verses, Haggai 1, the first 11 verses, that becomes really, really clear. And then from 522 to 486, Darius, who you know of as Darius the Great or Darius the First, uh, came into power, and he's there. It's in the second year of his reign that they're going to start rebuilding the temple. So about 520 is when they start rebuilding the temple uh, again. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that Darius for a few moments. But uh, what was the condition before the attack? Well, we looked at it a little bit earlier. They were fearful already, and they were already a little bit discouraged. But once they were accused and those attacks came and the king said, stop, they wanted to give up and go home without a fight. That's, that's the way that they did it. Um, so Haggai, one of the prophets that we just read about, started writing to them or started prophesying to them. Look at Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, notice here he calls him Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, which in the other it said Jehozadak, which is the same person. Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says the time has not come, that the time that the Lord's house should be built. You know, the time, in other words, they're saying, look, it's not the right timing. The, you know, it's kind of interesting to me. The, the opposition is out there. The king has said, don't build it. Now, God has said to build it, but the king has said, don't build it. And so how do the people rationalize that? They say, well, you know, it's really just not the best time. We don't need to do that. That's, that's the, what they were saying, and God is saying, this is what the people are saying. Does that sound kind of familiar to you? Uh, you get ready to do anything, and somebody says, well, yeah, that's a good thing to do, but it's just not good to do right now. You know, yeah, we need more evangelism, but right now is not a good time. Or, or yes, we, we need to become involved in uh, more benevolent activity, but right now is not the right time. Uh, people say, uh, you know, I, I need to start that business, I need to finish that book, I need to do whatever it is that we're supposed to be doing. But the timing is just not right right now. I can tell you that Satan will keep doing that to you. And the timing will never seem exactly right. Do you remember uh, how when uh, Paul spoke to him that one man said, when I have a convenient season, when I have a convenient time, I'll call you? Uh, do you remember how that uh, one of the kings that he spoke to said, almost you persuade me to be a Christian? In other words, timing isn't right right now. You almost did it. Uh, timing just isn't right. Satan will keep you that way. He will keep telling you to wait. Just wait because the timing isn't right. Now look at verse how God answers that. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Now he says, you say it's not time. So what time is it? God's telling him, what time is it? Is it time for you to live in a comfortable house? And not just in a house, but in a paneled house. The whole idea is you're living in houses that have a degree of luxury with it. And my house is lying in ruins. Are you telling me it's not time? Uh, God says, is this the kind of time it is for you to take care of yourself and not take care of what you do? And then he says, consider your ways. And when you read Haggai, that's the, one of the, the main thoughts in Haggai is consider your ways. Think about what you're doing is what he's telling them. Stop and, and take account of what you're doing. Look at it from an eternal perspective. And then when he tells them to consider their ways, look at verse 6 of Haggai chapter 1. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. 
And he who earns wages earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. He said, have you, you hadn't noticed? He said, if you're talking about the times, have you not noticed this? That no matter how much you sell, you don't get enough back? Uh, that, that you never seem to have enough food? You never seem to have enough to drink? Uh, you don't stay warm in the winter no matter how many clothes you put on? Uh, you earn wages, but it just keeps going out like you were carrying it with a bag with holes and it all keeps falling out? He says, haven't you noticed that? Do you not know why? Have you not figured out why that is? And then look at verses 7 through 9. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. For you looked for much, but indeed it came to little when you brought it home. And when you brought it home, it blew away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. I, this is a powerful, powerful thing. He says, look, you glorify me first. Remember what your life is about. Do you remember when Solomon has tried to find the purpose of life and, he, and over in Ecclesiastes, he tries everything. And, and he was smart enough and wealthy enough to absolutely try it all. He tried pleasure and he could have more pleasure than almost anybody else on earth. And he said, that's striving after wind. That's just, uh, that's vanity. And then he said, well, I'll do it in building, and, and I'll do it in, in, in accomplishing all of these things physically. And he built great houses and, and built great reservoirs and all sorts of things. And he says, but in the end, there wasn't any satisfaction in it. And he said, well, I'll get men singers and women singers, and that ought to do it. And the entertainment world will keep me distracted, and everything will be good. And he did that. And he said, but in the end, it didn't really satisfy and he said, well, I'll go into the houses of laughter. I'll go to the comedy clubs. That's what he's really basically saying. I'll go to the comedy clubs. I've got enough money. I can get the funniest guys around, and they'll fill my, fill my palace with humor. And guess what? It didn't make me happy. And I'll go to the houses then of mourning because at least I'll find my purpose in that. And he, so he goes to the houses of mourning where people have lost loved ones, and he says, and it didn't bring me wisdom. That didn't help me at all. And at the end, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. He said, this is what makes you fulfilled. This is what makes life worthwhile. And God says, look, there's a temple that I want. I will take pleasure in it and it will glorify me. He said, you do that and you'd be surprised how your fortunes are going to turn around. You don't do that and everything's going to come to nothing, whatever it is. You look for much, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. And why did I do that? I, I love this. He says, because my house is in ruins while every one of you runs to his own house. He said, you take care of first things first. When Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, you need to know that he didn't give it to a bunch of rich people. Uh, he didn't give it to a bunch of people who had all kinds of options in life. They were an occupied territory, and the Romans had absolute control over them to do whatever they wanted. They could compel them to go a mile with them. Uh, anything you're doing, they can stop you and say, carry my pack for a mile, and you'd have to do it. That was just part of what it meant to be in an occupied territory. You had no real rights. Uh, they, could, they could beat you without a trial, imprison you without a trial. They could even crucify you without a trial. Uh, if you weren't a, a Roman citizen, you had no rights at all. And most people didn't have a lot of money. So when he says things like, um, why do you worry about what you'll eat or what you'll drink or what you'll put on? He wasn't talking to people who had access to HelloFresh three times a week and could get it delivered to their door. He wasn't talking about people who could walk to their closet and have a choice of at least 10 sets of clothes they could wear on that day. He was talking to people who might have one set and it might be falling apart. He was talking to people who didn't have anything, didn't have any rights, didn't have any possessions to speak of. And, and then he said at the end, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. What things? What we'll eat what we'll drink, what we'll put on. He said, I'll take care of that if you'll take care of this. Seek first his kingdom first. Now, the problem for this nation is they're seeking everything else except this. They're, they can excuse it. They can say, well, the king said not to. They can excuse it all they want, but they can't please God that way. 
if they seek him first, then everything else is going to come into line. Now look at verses 10 and 11. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I call for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, and whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. God says, you know, that didn't just happen by accident. I did that. And anybody could say, well, it was just a drought. Yeah, but it was a drought that was caused by God. So where does the attack come from to them? Where is that real attack coming from? I, I think it's an important question. Well, look at, look, go over to Zechariah for a moment. We're going to get back in and finish up chapter 5. But if without this background, all this is happening at the same time. Okay, at the point that they're not building is the same time that these prophets are prophesying and saying, you need to be building. So look at Zechariah chapter 3 and notice verses 1 through 5. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of God and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed in filthy garments and was standing before the angel. If you're wondering where the ultimate attack is coming from, it's coming from Satan, okay? What was it that motivated the people to oppose rebuilding the temple? Satan was. And, and, and who is it that is opposing them now in the king? Well, Satan's behind all of that. Uh, when all of these oppositions are coming to them, they're coming from one real source, and that source is Satan. And, and here he shows it in a story that he tells. This isn't, this isn't meant to be anything more than a vision. It's not saying that this literally is happening in this way, that there's a time where you know God, Joshua the high priest is standing up in filthy garments, and you've got Satan on this side, and you've got the angel of the Lord on this side, and, uh, and that's the way that it is. It just means this is the way that it is spiritually, that you've got Joshua who represents the presence of God among the people, and he's in filthy garments. And what's Satan doing? Well, Satan is an accuser. What's he doing? He's accusing Joshua and saying he's not worthy. And the Lord says, I've chosen Jerusalem. Satan's saying they're nothing. And God says, but I, I have chosen them. And he says, and it's like a brand plucked from the fire. You've tried to kill it and destroy it, but I haven't let that happen. I took it out before you could destroy it. Uh, and then look at verses, uh, just go on with me to beginning at verse 4 through verse 5 on that. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, that is to Joshua, he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you. I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Uh, in this case, what are you talking about? God says, look, I not only have saved him from destruction from Satan, but I have purified him. I've made Joshua a person who can stand before me, and I will accept him. Now build this temple. That's what he's telling them. Uh, this is, it's holy, it's my intention, and I'm blessing him, and we're going to build this temple. Now go back to Haggai for a second. Haggai chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, and you find out, what the people did in response to this. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedach, uh, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. Up to this point, he's been saying, look, I'm opposing you. Uh, you're, you're continuing to have poverty here. and You're continuing to struggle here. You're working three times harder than you thought you should, and you're not gaining anything for, from it. It's because you haven't put me first. He says, now you've put me first. Guess what? I'm now with you. I'm not going to be fighting you. I'm not going to create those issues for you. I'm going to help you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. They've obeyed the, the voice of the Lord. Why are they obeying the voice of the Lord? Look at verse 12. The people feared the presence of the Lord. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. If you can find people who fear God, and I mean really fear God, you find people who tend not to be afraid of anybody else. 
Uh, if, if God is the one that you fear, and it's interesting to me that the word for fear here is the same word that's used when it talks about terror. Uh, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, Paul says, we persuade men. But it's that same idea of, of not just fearing in the sense of respecting, but fearing him. And, and in what way is that? Am I running scared of God all the time? No, that's not what he's talking about. But what he is talking about is people who finally take God seriously. What does that mean? It means that you mess around with God and you're playing with fire. That if you decide that God is not uh, the priority for your life, you're inviting disaster to your life. Uh, and you ought to be afraid of that. It doesn't mean that you don't love him, and it doesn't mean you're driven primarily by, uh, by terror, but it means you know to take him seriously. My dad, um, my dad and I got along pretty well most of the time. Uh, we really, really did. Uh, you know, he was gone a lot, so that helped. But uh, we, we did. We got along, and, and everything went, uh, went fine. But I want to tell you something. Every once in a while, I would cross the line. And I remember always thinking, it looked like my dad's eyeballs dropped back into his skull and fire came out, and he would call me James William. And uh, whenever my dad called me James William, I wanted to head for the high hills. I wanted to get out of there because I knew that he was absolutely serious and I was in trouble. And we had uh, a few meaningful learning experiences when I was growing up. Uh, those uh, MLEs, meaningful learning experiences, generally happened for us in the bathroom. Daddy had a belt and I had a backside and they met. Uh, that was what happened during those days. And I'm just telling you, those were not pleasant times for me. But I knew if my dad tells me something, I don't want him to have to tell me twice. Because with my dad, if he told me the second time, we were headed to a meaningful learning experience. It was the first time or I was in trouble. God's saying exactly the same thing. He's saying, you take me seriously. When I tell you something, do not ignore it. When I tell you to build it, build it. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. They built it, even though at the time that they're now building it, they're still under an order from the king in Persia saying, don't build it, okay? Why will they build it now when they wouldn't build it then? Because they fear God more than they fear that king. That's why. Because their fear of God is greater than their fear of a king. Uh, when, I, when I have a respect and honor of God that's greater than my respect and honor of anyone else, when I have a fear of God that's greater than my fear of anyone else, I'm going to start doing what he says. And, and these people are now doing exactly what he says. Well, look, at, look again at verses 14 and 15. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Or King Darius. If you remember, he started reigning, as we looked at it on the thing, in 422 uh, I believe that's right, 422. And so it's about 420 uh, that, that's taking place right here when these, these guys begin to work again on the house of the Lord. So they're working on the house of the Lord right there. Now, I want you to, I'm jumping back and forth between the prophets because I think it's important to get the context of what we're talking about in chapter 5. So go over to Zechariah chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall be a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. That's, in other words, he says, Good, listen, Zerubbabel, you're going to finish this, and it won't be because you're smart enough or resilient enough or brave enough or strong enough. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's my, by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And, and if it's by God's spirit, what mountain is bigger than God? He says, who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you'll become a plain. What, who is anybody before God? What's any obstacle before God? If God wants us to do something, then we ought to be about doing it. In the midst of a, of a pandemic, rather than saying what we really need to do is ford up and hope we don't all die. What we really need to do instead is saying, what an opportunity this is to serve God. He's given us a job to do here, and he hasn't taken it back because of COVID-19. To worship, 
to tell people about him, to live honorably, to, to love our neighbors, to bless our enemies, all of those things, COVID-19 hasn't changed a thing. Not a thing about what God wants us to do. So what's COVID-19 as compared to God? What's the economic situation in America compared to God? He says, do what I'm telling you to do. I'll bless you. And he says, I'll give you the power to finish it. He says, the capstone means the very last stone you put on the temple. He says, Drubbable, you're still going to be here and you're going to do it. You're going to put the capstone on the temple. You'll finish it. And the whole town, the whole nation is going to be shouting grace, grace to it. In other words, it's done. It's done. Now, back up for a moment to Zechariah chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. Then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua. So we had a word of God to to Zerubbabel there in chapter 4. Here's the word to Joshua. He admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my command, then you also shall judge my house, and likewise have charge of my courts. I will give you places to walk among these who stand here. Wow. Okay. Two or three things that can be meant by that. But but, uh, he says, do this. If you walk in my ways, if you keep my commands, then I'll let you walk in my house. It's the, it's the temple that he's talking about here. And he said, and I'll let you have charge of my courts, the house, the temple, and all the courts that are surrounding it. He said, I'm going to turn that over to you, and all those who work here will be working under you. He says, I'm, I'm telling you that. And he says, I will give you places to walk among these who stand here. Okay, what's he talking about? There's all kinds of priests and Levites that are all around them, and, and there are people who are looking to him to lead them. And he says, You'll have a place to walk right here. I have a job for you to do. But I think, I think the other thing that strikes me on this is that uh, you'll be worthy to be here, that you'll have the right to be here. And this is the place where, where the priest throughout the time from the time of Solomon until the time of the carrying away into captivity, there were some great priests during that time, some great high priests. He says, you'll be right among them. You'll be in that same group. Uh, I think sometimes we look at people in the past, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. uh, We see them. We see uh, folks in the New Testament, Paul, Peter, Andrew, uh, all the others that you read about. And you think, these people are of a different caliber than me. That uh, these people are, are greater than me. Elijah, who is amazing, is greater than me. And yet, when James writes about Elijah, he says Elijah was a man with a passion or nature just like us. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and it didn't rain. And he prayed again, and, it, and the earth brought forth rain. He said he was a lot like us. If, if I make a commitment to walk in the ways of God, if I make a commitment to keep the commands of God, I walk in the same steps as Paul and Peter and Elijah and others. You don't have to hang your head and say, man, there's not much. There were, there were folks who were looking at the foundation of the temple when it was laid that remembered the early temple and they cried because this temple wasn't as great as the temple that Solomon had built. And he says, don't despise the day of small things. This is where my king's going to walk. This is where my king is going to walk, right here in this place, talking about Jesus, that he was going to be there. He says, so don't you dare think that it's not valuable. And don't you dare look at your life as though you don't make a difference. You have the right to walk just like Paul, just like Peter. If you'll listen to my ways, walk in my ways, if you'll obey my commands, you fit in that same group. And one of these days when we get to heaven... We won't have to hang our heads in shame around the great ones that we read about in the scripture because we'll be one of them. And God will point to you and say, these are the people that I have decided to bless. These are the people that I've saved. That in the ages to come, the Bible says, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So that when the rest of the universe is looking and seeing the redeemed, God is pointing to you. He's pointing to me, not just to Paul and to Peter and to Elijah. He's pointing to us, and he says, these are my people, and these were my faithful people. You walk among them. I think that's part of what he's talking about here. Well, let's get back to Ezra. We're finally getting to verse 2, okay? Uh, Ezra chapter 5, verse 2. 
So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God, who you know are Haggai and Zechariah, the prophets of God were with them, helping them. So that's what they're doing, and that's what we've been reading about, and that's the reason we've gone back and forth on, on all of this. Now, opposition continues here. There's an inquisition that comes up. I want you to look at this. In verses 3 through 5, at the same time, Tatani, the governor of the region beyond the river, and Shethar Bosni, and their companions came to them and spoke thus to them, Who's commanded you to build this temple and to finish this wall? Then accordingly we told them the names of the men who were constructing this building. But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, so that they could not make them cease till a report could go to Darius. Then a written answer was returned concerning this matter. Now, notice what it says. Now they're being opposed, and they're saying, we're not stopping. We've decided that this is what God wants, and we've seen what happens when we don't do this. And so we're not stopping. So they sent off a letter, these guys, Tat and I, uh, sends off a letter and, uh, with his companions, and they're trying to stop it, uh, doing what they're doing. Now, so here's a copy. This is what it says in verse 6. And it tells, you this, it tells you the exact letter. By the way, what's interesting to me is that uh, this is a real letter, and, and Ezra keeps real records, and he has a copy of the letter that's actually sent, so he puts it down to us. Even though it's 60 years before he shows up, he has a copy of that letter, and he's writing it down. He says, this is what happened. I found it very interesting that when you look at uh, the, the Old Testament, and for instance, it tells you what the uh, ancient kings took from the, uh, from the temple in Jerusalem, the articles that they took from the temple in Jerusalem, and then you go over to the British Museum and you find the steel from the wall or the, the uh, place on the wall where uh, the king had recorded what he had taken, and you can open your Bible and you can look at that and they say exactly the same thing. It's a real record. And so he has a real record here. This is a copy of the letter that Tat and I sent, the governor of the region beyond the river, and Shethar Bozani and his companions, the Persians, who were in the region beyond the river, to Darius the king. Now, he's writing to Darius the king. Don't get this Darius the king mixed up with the Darius and Daniel. They're not the same person at all. Uh, so I'll kind of give you some background. There was Cyrus the Great, who was the great king, uh, first great king of the Persians. And Darius, that's talked about in Daniel, who came and actually took the t city of Babylon, is probably an uncle of, of, uh, of Cyrus. But he's not the great Cyrus, he's, or not the great uh, Darius. And then uh, Cambyses is Cyrus's son, uh, who came to reign partly with him and then after he passes away. And Cambyses is sent down to Egypt. I'm going to tell you this so you'll understand about the pseudo Um Cambyses is sent down to Egypt by his dad, and his job is to, is to sub, subjugate the people of Egypt. That's what he's trying to do. Now, it's not a very successful campaign, but he goes down there, and he's down there for several years to do it. Now, while he's down there fighting, Cyrus the Great dies. He dies in, back in Persia. And so when he finds out that his father is dead, then he tries to end his campaign, Cambyses does, and to get back up to Persia so that he can take over the throne. But in the meantime, there is a guy named Smyrtus. They call him pseudo Smyrtus. And the reason he's called that is because he claimed to be a son of Cyrus. He was lying. But he convinced a whole lot of people that he was, te that he was telling the truth. And so they recognized him for a very short time as the, as the king uh, in the place of Cyrus. Now, when Cambyses got back, he told them, he's not my brother, and he was killed, and that's the end of pseudo Smyrtus. He, did, he didn't last very long, I'm just telling you. But that's who pseudo Smyrtus was. Now, after Cambyses, there was, uh, there was Darius the Great. You also know him as Darius the First. Uh, he's called both in, in history. Um, he's also called Hystaspes. Uh, he is the son-in-law of Cyrus. And after Cambyses' death, he begins to be king. And then his son, Xerxes I, uh, becomes the next king, and he's the husband of Esther. He's the Ahasuerus that you read about in Esther. So kind of getting some background as to what all's happening here and what's going on with some of this stuff, okay? Um, but, but Darius has become king. 
So this is the time. And remember, 422 is when he began to reign. And so he has now become king. They started in 420, and now they're moving on. So it's, it's sometime later. Darius the Great, or Darius the First, was a very important person. He expanded the Persian kingdom into in India and Egypt. Uh, he established a postal system. He reformed taxation. Uh, he lost the famous Battle of Marathon to the Greeks uh, that uh, set up the next great battle that is, you remember, if you ever saw the story of the 300, you know something about that next great battle. Uh, but it proved to the Greeks that they could beat them. He, the Greeks had rebelled, and he was going to put them in subjection, and he lost that battle. And then he finally lost the whole thing. Uh, and his son also lost after him. Uh, and then uh, he was actually kind to the Jews. He, he, was, he was a person noted for his kindness toward the Jewish nation. So go back to Ezra and look at chapter 5, verses 7 through 17 now. We also asked them, this, we're still quoting from the letter that was written. We also asked them their names to inform you that we might write the names of the men who were chief among them. And thus they returned us with an answer saying, We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and we are rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago, which a great king of Israel built and completed. But because, of our, because our fathers provoked the God of heaven to wrath, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this temple and carried the people away to Babylon. This is their history. You know this history. Uh, but the folks here didn't know that history. Now they continue to answer. However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, King Cyrus issued a decree to build the, this house of God. Also, the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple that was in Jerusalem and carried away in, into the temple of Babylon, those King Cyrus took from the temple of Babylon, and they were given to one named Shezbazer, whom he had made governor, which, by the way, I think is the same person as, as uh, Zerubbabel. Uh, I think that this is the same person because it seems to be when you read everything together. Okay. And then uh, they're continuing the letter, verse, if you start with verse 15. And he said to them, take these articles, go carry them to the temple site that is in Jerusalem, and let the house of God be rebuilt on its former site. Then the same Shezbazer came and laid the foundation of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. But from that time, even until now, it has been under construction, and it is not finished. So they're, again, giving this whole story and this whole history. But they said, check the records, and you're going to find out that Cyrus actually sent us over here, that he intended for us to do it and even helped us on our way. Now, we'll get to the rest of the story in chapter 6, but we're going to end it with this in verse 17. Now, therefore, if it seems good to the king, let a search be made in the king's treasure house, which is there in Babylon, whether it is so that a decree was issued by King Cyrus to build the house of God at Jerusalem and let the king send us his pleasure concerning this matter. In other words, what do you want us to do about it? That's what they're asking. What do you want us to do about it? And, uh, and they're waiting for an answer. Now, chapter 6 is where you get that answer. But uh, in the meantime, I, I think that at least, even though the opposition is there, at least they're, they're writing a fair letter. Uh, they're actually representing exactly what the Jews said and, uh, and, and sending it back and said, please check and see if this is true. And so the rest of the story comes next week as we get a chance to look and see uh, whether, what kind of answer they're actually going to get from the king, which is not the answer that most people expected them to get. But they're going to get uh, an answer from the king, and we'll look at that next week in, in chapter 6. But if we could just take a minute and kind of look at everything that we've gone through, God is concerned that we put him first. Now, you might wonder, why is it that God is concerned that we put him first? Is God some kind of egomaniac that just has to be bowed down to all the time? Is that what God's about? Is he that kind of person that you don't even want to be around? Is he that kind of person? Uh, because it, it strikes me that if you have anybody that's an acquaintance of yours who always says, I have to be right, if you have an acquaintance of yours who always says, you have to give in to me, uh, and you have to listen to me, but I don't necessarily have to listen to you, uh, that it's my way or the highway, if you've got any acquaintances like that, how many of you hang around those people very long? Uh, you don't, do you? You don't have much to do with them. Uh, so why would we listen to God, and why would we do that? Because God isn't an egomaniac, and because God sees who we really are. And he knows that the primary problem that we have in life is selfishness. 
and serious. We are primarily at the center, self-centered. That's where we are, that we want our needs met. We, we are born needing our needs met, and we have a hard time growing out of that. Uh, and so we're always toward ourselves. The other thing is that, that as long as we are making ourselves the most important thing, we're never very happy people. Uh, because if, if, if my needs are the most important thing, then I'm always going to need more than I have or want more than I, than I need. That's just the way that human nature works. We're never going to be happy. We're never going to find our joy in that. God actually is greater than us. He actually did make us. And he knows that in order for us not to be selfish, we need to acknowledge that. And when we acknowledge that and we praise him for what he's done, we find ourselves happy. Uh, I said it before from C.S. Lewis and his reflections on the Psalms, where that C.S. Lewis pointed out that it occurred to him one day that the people who were the most well-balanced, some of the most brightest and most well-balanced people on earth, were people who praised, that uh, they praised everything. They praised everything from their favorite football team to their girlfriends to a work of art to a, a meal that they ate. They praised everything. And that the people who never praised were the least well-balanced and, and the less happy of all the people that he'd ever known. That God intends for us to put him first because God has our best interest at heart, not his. Because he knows it's good for us. Because if we do it, you and I become people who other people want to be around. You and I become people who find our, our fulfillment and our purpose and our peace in our ability to empty ourselves in the praise of God. And when we do that, we find out who we really are. So Jesus said, whosoever shall save his life will lose it. But whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. If you want to find out who you are, quit looking deep inside you. Start looking to God. And you find out exactly who you are. You find out exactly what it is that makes joy and happiness in life. And God knows that. And so he says, you put me first. If you don't put me first, then all the other stuff that you're trying to do isn't going to work out for you. It's just not going to work out for you. Uh, it's amazing to me. Uh, I, look at, I look at so many people that I know who are highly intelligent people. Uh, I like to be around really intelligent people because I can bring the entire IQ of the room down by standing in it. But, uh, but I enjoy being around very intelligent people because I, I like to see what they've accomplished. I like to hear what they're thinking and uh, enjoy and learn and a lot of things from it. But one of the things that I've observed is that a lot of the highly educated, highly intelligent people I know are some of the most depressed people I've ever met. Not all of them. Some of them are amazingly joyful, but some of them are incredibly depressed. Their intelligence has moved them in a direction where they've been so focused on this and not focus here, that they have no joy in their life. And they see no real happy end to anything. That there's a gloom and doom outlook. And it comes about because in the pursuit of something excellent, they forgot to pursue the most excellent thing. And they've missed out. They've missed out. I don't want them to miss out. Uh, I try to introduce them back to the God who gave them their intelligence in the first place. Some listen, some don't. But I... But I I noticed that, that, it's, that possessions, acquisition, intelligence, accomplishment, all these things, Solomon said it a long time ago. He said they're empty. It's like trying, he says, it's like striving after wind. It's like trying to grasp the wind in your hand. It just keeps eluding you. It always will. Until you turn your eyes toward him, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. When the people figured this out, life started changing for them. And you'll see how it changed when you get into chapter 6. But let's stop right there and, and go on. We'll, we'll uh, have a prayer and then be dismissed for the night. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you that you've blessed us. We thank you that you've given us this time. And we ask, Father, that our eyes might always be towards you. We need you every moment of our lives. And even in our most talented and capable and intelligent form, we fall far short of who we need to be and what we need to be and what we need to have.
Father, it's in you that we find our fulfillment, our joy, our purpose, and our peace. And I'm asking that you would be with us tonight, that you would be with us this week. Help us to fix our eyes on you so that whatever it is that the world throws at us, we see it. And we don't just run from it, but we face it with perspective and with the knowledge that those who hold on to you in the end will win. We're thankful for that, Father. Thank you for loving us like that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys.